But I want to, um, in effort of staying somewhat on time, move to Dr. Dr. Adelson, who we've been fortunate to hear already. But uh, for those that uh, don't know, uh, is the director of the Barrow Neurologic Institute at Phoenix Children and the chief of pediatric neurosurgery there, um, and has been very influential in, in the care of severe TBI uh, children. And is, we're fortunate to hear him talk about operative interventions for pediatric traumatic brain injury. Well, well, thank you, and uh, again, I appreciate the invitation to be here and, and uh, speak to this audience. So I'm going to give just an overview of the operative intervention for pediatric traumatic brain injury. I think it'll overlap a little bit uh, with some of the, the other speakers um, uh, that will come uh, later, but um, I also threw in an overview of kind of what you'll be hearing um, with regards to uh, uh, the other speakers. So. Um, as many of you know, and uh, trauma, and particularly traumatic brain injury, uh, remains the leading cause of death and disability in children. In fact, if we look at all causes of death and disability in kids, uh, the mortality from trauma, and in particular, uh, particularly TBI, is greater than all other of these diseases combined. Um, I think what you've seen, unfortunately, is that most of our understanding uh, for the management of these patients really comes from single institution series and cohorts. And uh, really with my involvement with uh, guidelines and actually some of the other speakers' involvement, it's become a real challenge in the developing recommendations based on the evidence that we have. Um, we still go ahead and make those recommendations. But again, those recommendations are based on um, the unfortunate um, low level of evidence that uh, that we all have. Um, I can go to the next slide, please. Uh, next, please. Add some animation. So I wanted to just give a quick case uh, uh, study. This was a 15-year-old young man who uh, was uh, on a skateboard and he was hit by a car. Uh, he came in a GCS of uh, four. Um, we quickly got in, uh, you can see here, um, an external uh, ventricular drain in the uh, third ventricle. Um, but you can also see how tight this brain looks uh, in general. This child went through very quickly <clears throat> the protocols for medical management, <clears throat> but um, unfortunately his, his intracranial pressure continued to uh, rise. So this case, <clears throat> I went ahead and uh, next slide please. Um, uh, performed uh, a, a decompressive craniectomy here. You can see just high frontal. Uh, it included a, a dural opening as well as a falsing takedown. And, um, and then this child over time um, seemed to do well as ICP was under much better control. And uh, we were eventually able to uh, wean his, uh, um, his uh, meds and, and eventually uh, get him out to uh, rehab. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the, the, um, the, uh, this child, this is a picture about a month later, and uh, what we see is um, that this child is now no longer swollen outside of the, the skull as he was before, but you know, he's obviously taken a, a fairly diffuse hit, but um, we were at this time able to uh, in his case, put back uh, the bone about a month or so later, and this child went to um, rehab and, and did very, very well. Um, you become then very sold on something because this was the first case and the patient did great, uh, but decompressive craniectomy, you know, as we've learned over the years, is, is not the, uh, the end all, and, and we have to be very careful in its uh, application. Um, one of the problems with decompressive craniectomy is that, unfortunately, the early history was unfavorable and really fell out of favor in the, the 60s and 70s. Uh, but really, over the past, I would say, 10, 15 years, and as what can be seen by the literature, is that there's really been an improved experience, particularly from the military experience, which um, really re markedly reduced the mortality uh, in the uh, recent conflicts in the Middle East. Um, as a result, it's become much more acceptable um, as a treatment option, and it has most often been used as a second-tier therapy, not as a, necessarily a first-tier. But unfortunately, there are still many questions that remain, and, 
and in particular, what, how they remain for uh, children. So what do we know about the management of traumatic brain injury? Well, overall, we have some basic support uh, for patients, and those are really the, the idea of avoiding hypoxia, hypotension, shock, um, managing other injuries, and we sort of term those as the avoidance of uh, second insults. We also have some treatments for intracranial hypertension, so managing ICP, which ultimately is really a reactive response to the secondary injury mechanisms uh, that you'll likely hear about uh, from some of the other speakers. But let me just touch on what do we use surgical intervention for? Well, we use surgical intervention for really two things. One is the avoidance of second insults, which, for example, if there's an epidural hematoma increasing or something along those lines, then we really truly want to not let that blood clot continue to press on the brain and cause herniation. So we use surgery in those cases. But we also use surgery such as decompressive craniectomy really as a response to those secondary injury to the swelling of the brain where intracranial hypertension is becoming a problem. So surgical intervention can be used inter, inter, uh, intermingling uh, depending again on the pathology and the, the mechanisms being in, uh, that are involved. So for, with regards to um, the management of intracranial hypertension, it involves the insertion of an ICP monitor and for the most part the rest of treatment, whether it be medical or surgical, is very much ICP, intracranial pressure, or cerebral perfusion pressure-directed therapy. We have general maneuvers, again, to try to prevent second insults like fever, uh, normal uh, uh, hypoxia, or hypercarbia, or hypocarbia. Again, those are what we're using generally. We like the head at about 30 degrees with the head in midline um, in a relaxed position um, as well, neutral position, so it allows for good venous outflow from the brain. Again, question of when you would use a collar or not, sometimes the collar can be quite useful to maintain this position rather than having the, head, the child's head flexed or bent over to the side. Otherwise, the child should be uh, in a neutral position. We can use analgesia and paralysis, particularly for a child that's moving around that may be contributing to this. We can use external ventricular drainage and then other treatments like hyperosmolotherapy and even some moderate um, uh, hyperventilation if, if necessary. Um, this should only be used when directed by uh, brain oxygen, which I'm sure will be from the, in the ICU portion of this um, uh, discussion. Um, next, as the second tier therapies include barbiturates, uh, hypothermia, and then decompressive surgery, as I, as I just mentioned. Next, please. So when it comes to decompressive surgery, next please. Um, the goals of surgery are really to um, either remove a mass lesion, as I mentioned earlier, or to try to treat the intractable intracranial hypertension. Uh, its goal is to obviously attain that and provide some room for swelling, improve perfusion of the injured brain, and then hopefully reduce the need for medical management because a lot of these therapies have some potential for um, adding uh, further insult to injury. If you have, for example, a very hypernatremic into the 160s, 170s, this could potentially damage other organs. Um, obviously, those are the kinds of things that we would like to try to avoid. Next slide, please. With regards to decompression, we do decompression for either primary reasons to treat herniation, um, uh, or uh, treat intracranial hypertension that's unresponsive to medical therapy, or we can do a secondary decompressive craniectomy, as in that we're going in to remove a subdural, and in those instances, we anticipate or experience uh, brain swelling during surgery. In those instances, we would leave out the bone in order to uh, try to prevent uh, further injury. Next slide. So there's a, there are a lot of different uh, methods, and, and again, there's a lot of questions about what's best, um, how you use it. Um, it is very dependent on the pathology and the mechanisms, uh, but you can do unilateral versus bilateral, frontotemporal versus um, uh, just frontal, circumferential, bilateral in those instances. Um, uh, with a bony ridge, without a bony ridge, there's so many different methodologies. None of them uh, have been particularly found to be more useful than the other. 
Uh, again, the recommendation is depending on the pathology. If you're taking out a unilateral subdural with a lot of swelling unilaterally, then a unilateral approach is, is best. In the case that I presented where there was just diffuse swelling, a bifrontal temporal decompression uh, was quite effective in, in, in that particular patient. Um, and again, open or closed dura, duraplasty, no duraplasty, how you do it, lots of questions still remain. Next slide, please. So again, these are some of the, the types of uh, decompressions that you might see. Um, unilateral, again, important to get a very wide decompression. In these instances, there was a stellate uh, dural opening here. Uh, here is contusion. Some instances, the contusion may be removed. Here you can see a bifrontal with a, a bony ridge over the, uh, the sagittal sinus to protect that. Um, I haven't personally used that, but it's uh, written about in the literature, and there is uh, variability as to uh, the approach there. Next slide, please. So when we see this, again, um, this is using a pericranium for a dural flap. In this case, it's um, vascular, a vascular rise, so it, it uh, potentially has um, the ability to incorporate. But again, others have used uh, allograft, um, and uh, those can uh, vary from... Uh, uh, from procedure to procedure. Next slide, please. So what is the evidence base for the use of uh, decompressive craniectomy? Next slide, please. Um, so there are a couple of uh, randomized trials that have been done in adults, uh, the rescue ICP trial and the Decker trial, uh, which are well known. And uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, again, uh, this is the, uh, the, the differences between the two um, uh, studies, um, and again, uh, one that was really focused on primary decompression versus uh, secondary decompression and early versus late, and one can appreciate that, and again, um, the differences in the protocols between these uh, two adult studies uh, on decompression. Um, with regards to what they found, there were really no differences between the two groups. Uh, that um, in fact there might even be higher complications in the in the adult studies, and so for that reason, it has not been um, very popular, and uh, um, at least in in uh, recommendations from uh, those two uh, groups. Um, there was a lot of controversy in this when one looked at the the data, but as a result, there um, it's still out there as to many questions about its uh, utilization. When it comes to children, uh, most of the studies have uh, been, for the most part, single institution. There's not been any real multi-center um, randomized trial for, uh, uh, for children. There's a lot of uh, uh, single institution, um, many times single treatment type of cohorts, though there are a number of um, attempts at having age match controls that have been coming out in the last few years. Um, and so what you'll see in the uh, likely upcoming revision of the guidelines is that decompression can be used uh, for reversing uh, early neurologic deterioration or herniation, um, and that treating uh, intracranial hypertension, uh, hypertension refractory to medical management uh, has been correlated with improving with regards to um, uh, just treating uh, ICP. So it, it, there are some, as I mentioned, very low-level studies that have shown that it improves outcome, uh, but those have been unfortunately very small sample size as well as um, um, uh, lacking uh, true controls uh, in those studies. Next slide, please. So if you look at the most recent guidelines um, in, from 2012, there were really no level one or level two recommendations in decompressive craniectomy. Next slide. And uh, these were the recommendations at a level three. Um, and you can see that it is uh, fairly vague. It uh, may be considered um, for early signs of, de of deterioration or developing intracranial hypertension uh, and should be used in, um, with really judgment uh, in their management. Next slide, please. And what are the outcomes? I mean, as much as I showed you uh, this patient on the right uh, who had um, uh, you know, very good outcome, uh, the, the patient on the left, um, you know, there are many instances where we don't see as good an outcome. Next slide, please. Um, 
Uh, there's wide variability, um, and and so when one looks at the review of the literature, um, ages designated pediatric differ from study to study. Indications utilized differ. The types of surgery, as well as what were the outcomes uh, in those patients. Next slide, please. So again, as mentioned, there can be some patients who uh, uh, don't do very well, and and you know one can see here in the bilateral decompression uh, with, you know, severe um, uh, conca concavity uh, to both sides. Uh, this was a patient that uh, overall did not do well. Next slide, please. Um, but yet, here's a child who has significant concavity as well in, in the area of the surgery, uh, who, was, um, who obviously had a very open, depressed uh, series of fractures. Next slide, please. But um, when one sees her and, and sees her recovery and how well she did in, in this particular case, uh, this child made a, a remarkable and significant recovery. And, you know, again, it's, it's those type of patients that we, we would like to try to see more of. Next slide, please. So when one looks at outcomes, um, there are a number of uh, meta, there was a recent meta-analysis that tried to pool all of the different patients. Uh, it has been shown to be a, a useful salvage procedure. Uh, did have some good outcomes uh, when one looked at the meta-analysis, but again, you have to. We have to look at this as a class three evidence and level three recommendation. Next slide, please. Some of the potential risks: um, the perioperative acute ones, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, the chronic ones, uh, really most concerning, is the hydrocephalus, which can have uh, quite. Uh, impact um, uh, on these patients um, and require shunting. Infection is uh, not um, unforeseen, could be as high as 15 or 20 percent in some cases. And so in those instances, we have to be, you know, quite careful and measured in our approach um, as we go there. So next slide, please. So as a result, uh, right now, um, decompressive craniectomy useful for controlling intracranial hypertension improving perfusion. It can be done relatively safely if one is aware of the potential complications and can be done with some uh, reasonable outcomes. Next slide, please. Um, but unfortunately, similarly lacking are the indications, optimal mechanisms and pathologies, timing, early versus late, and when to repair, uh, the types of decompression, and how we can avoid complications. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, um, I think the data at least partially supports at a level three uh, recommendation, lowering intracranial hypertension, really kind of waiting till medical management has been run through. And usually this can be done anywhere between six and 48 to 72 hours, uh, but it has not been established yet for absolutely improving outcome. Uh, there's no evidence to preclude its use. And again, it becomes now recommendation or judgment. Um, and I think really in the future, uh, that's where our goal should be, is how to get better evidence and better clinical studies to uh, move this uh, procedure either forward or back in our armamentarium. Thank you. Next slide. All right. Um, thank you, Dr. Carlson. That was great. Um, it's clearly a tough group, and, and I, I certainly can speak that I appreciate your, your overall aggressive nature to trying to find ways to, to help these kids, because we do, we do all see those kids that um, come through the door and we never thought we're gonna walk out and, and do, so we don't wanna, we don't wanna lose hope and, and keep trying. So with that, I'll uh, open it up to the panel here and, and the other, our other neurosurgeons on the line to, to ask any questions or provide other opinions. I've got a question. Uh, Dr. Allison, you've always been a big proponent of hypothermia. You didn't mention in your talk today. Do you uh, have any additional thoughts on that? <laughs> Um, well, I put it in the second tier therapy, and um, I still use it. Um, we, our study, uh, you know, was uh, it went to futility, and, and and there are some evidence that it has, you know, increased complications and things like that. Uh, I don't use hypothermia down to 32 to 33 anymore, uh, but I do use it to 34, 35, and uh, um, I use that actually as part of our. Um, really primary plus our first tier therapy. We do very uh, um, stringently control uh, temperature to avoid any 
uh, hyperthermia. The reality was is that our hypothermia trial was a medical management versus um, all other uh, treatment, and it ended up being more of hypothermia versus decompressive craniectomy study uh, because the normal thermia patients were going to decompression uh, more uh, three times as more commonly than the hypothermia. So um, I think that um, if they fail mild hypothermia and other medical management, it's reasonable to go to decompression. Uh, another question I have for you, I'm interested in your thoughts. There have been a number of, of prospective trials that have come out that call into question our um, normal values of intracranial pressure. What do, you, what, what do you consider treatment? If you have a teenager who's healthy, has a full brain and has ICPs with a picture showing diffuse axonal injury and kind of gets upset and runs an ICP of 25 or so, should, you be, should we be treating that? Um, it's a great question, and, and um, uh, again, you're absolutely right. It, it does. Um, one of my other talks is on how to individualize or personalize our management. I think probably Dr. Valvalala will talk a bit about that in her talk. But um, I think that it, it's from patient to patient. You're right. If there's DAI and the patient is otherwise in the kind of uh, mid-teens and then is spiking when they're agitated, um, uh, or even when they're not agitated, if it looks, you know, I think it's a, it's, um, uh, it's a judgment call. And so I, I do tend to be much more liberal in those instances. I just don't think that um, the CT scan can give you all the extent of injury. And um, it definitely does not give the extent of the mechanisms that are going on with these patients. And um, so, um, uh, you know, I have had patients that it looked like DAI and we were kind of fighting with ICP in the, even into the mid twenties, like you pointed out and we let it roll, you know, kind of figuring this was agitation. And then, yeah. you know, they had a full blown seizure and next thing you know, we were escalating therapy and decompressing. So uh, I think that it, you have to be careful in those instances. I think it's evidence of something. You have to put it in perspective with everything else that you're, me you're measuring. So, One question from the uh, audience that uh, popped up about the indications for intracranial monitoring in young children. I know it's, it's written as one thing and, and there's a lot, still a lot of variability, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. So I, I, our rule is that any child with a Glasgow Coma score, eight or less, gets a monitor. That's the rule. Now, do we make exceptions? Um, yes. I mean, if a child had had a post-traumatic seizure in the field and their post-ictal and in the other institution, they got a bunch of Versed and everything else, then we would probably wait a little bit to try to determine if that, you know, is a drug or post-ictal or something like that. We've also put in monitors on patients who had a moderate or, or, or GCS nine or 10, but had sort of contusions that concerned us and we have escalated therapy in those instances. So um, our rule is if they have a GCS of eight or less, um, but we do um, have a exit rule if, if they're extenuating other issues. So, and we do that in all children. And when in doubt, we put the wire in, um, at least an ICP wire. Uh, I think that the findings of intracranial hypertension or worry about it, I'd rather know than to be trying to guess why the kid's not waking up three days later, and then you find out they had an ICP in the 30s and 40s. Great, thank you. Dave, uh, you were in Pittsburgh in the days of cold xenon, um, <laughs> and, and there's a lot of interest now in assess bedside tests for uh, autoregulation, preservation of autoregulation. Uh, do you, um, do you incorporate any uh, evaluation of vascular reactivity in, in, your, in your management? We do. We don't use cold xenon right anymore. Obviously, it, it hasn't gotten FDA reapproval. Um, uh, but we do do TCD and we do brain oxygenation. We do it with uh, Lycox as well as we use uh, near-infrared spectroscopy. So we try to utilize as much monitoring as we can. We also look at EEG and... Um, so we really approach this in a multimodal approach. Uh, I'm sure Monica will talk about this. Um, you know, she's a real expert in understanding autoregulation and perfusion. And um, 
I've really tried to follow her lead as as well because uh, you know she's uh, she's written some great stuff and uh, I think now with the adapt trial going on, we're going to have an amazing amount of data that uh, wasn't available to us. Uh, I just met with Mike Bell on last Monday and. You know, we're, I think we're 30 patients less now, probably, uh, you know, short of our target of a thousand patients um, from uh, multi center, multinational uh, data. And I think that uh, we're going to have uh, that much more that will be available to us to better understand these different nuances of auto regulation and, and care. Great. Can, Thanks. I, uh, can oh, I just add ahead. a couple of things? I think it's a great question. And um, thank you, David. Um, I think that, you know, there's some small scale studies showing that there's a relationship between impaired auto regulation and, you know, even six month outcomes in these kids with severe traumatic brain injury. The, the reality, however, is that that kind of testing still remains primarily in the exploratory phase. So it's largely research. You know, I think there really does need to be some large long term um, outcome studies, looking at the specific relationships and the way to test auto regulation. There are so many way, different ways to do it. Um, there's a, you know, there's bedside monitoring where you collect lots of data, and you can look at spontaneous variations in blood pressure, CO2, um, cerebral blood flow, and mathematically figure out how well the neurovascular unit actually is regulating. At a very fundamental level, I think we are all in agreement that auto regulation is probably intact in normal, healthy children. Um, we have some normative data on this, and that it's disrupted in, you know, pediatric TBI. The question is: Is it a marker of disease, or is it actually a contributor to downstream um, complications? Probably the answer is a bit of both. Great. I'm glad. Um I had no doubt our neurosurgeons would finally start uh, start chiming in and voicing opinions, so that's great. 